Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. Was the mainstream calculus ever rigorous? That is the question I want to answer today. You've obviously heard the following expression many, many times, and no doubt read it in many textbooks, but the expression is, the calculus was made rigorous. Well, that expression is a lie. Mainstream calculus has never been rigorized by anyone. The new calculus is the first and only rigorous formulation of calculus in human history. However, the focus of this video will be the bogus mainstream calculus, whose results are generally correct, but whose formulation is flawed. So the first reason that the mainstream calculus is flawed is that it requires limit theory. In order for limit theory to work, there must be a valid construction of real number in place. There isn't. Neither Dedekind cuts nor equivalent Cauchy sequences of rational numbers are valid constructions of real numbers. And my video on this topic, which has this image displayed, proves that this is the case, that Dedekind cuts are not a valid construction. And neither are Cauchy sequences, because a Cauchy sequence is easily uh, derived from the lower set of a Dedekind cut. The second reason is that an invalid method involving division by zero is required to find the limit. Look, if you have any function such as x squared, and you go through that baloney called first principles derivation, you'll get 2x plus q of h, where q of h is an expression in x. In this case, q of h is h. But in order to find the derivative 2x, one must set q of h is equal to zero. But this is a contradiction because h is non-zero before it is cancelled in the finite difference and then it is zero after it is cancelled. This is the finite difference here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, finding the limit is equivalent to setting h equal to zero. It doesn't matter how you want to say it, whether you want to use epsilonics, and I'll get to that in a moment, or some other kind of language. At the end of the day, you're setting h equals to zero, and that's wrong. So, <clears throat> Academics love to say that the finite difference ratios approach the limit L, but the problem is that L may not be a rational number, but some incommensurable magnitude. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> to say that uh, to say that there's no division by zero is quite frankly delusional. You can't get two x unless you divide by zero. The limit definition is itself circular because it requires that you know the derivative. Do you see this L here? This is the derivative. Okay, so you can't just suddenly make up another circular definition and say, given epsilon greater than zero, delta greater than zero, then whenever this distance is less than delta, this distance here implies it's less than epsilon. Where did you get epsilon? Where did you get this L from? L was derived from using the first principles method. Therefore, L is equal to F dash of C or F prime of C, which is the derivative. So you're using it in its own definition, which is absolute garbage. This definition is more of a, a very finition. That's a word I made up because really all one does is show that it is correct using this uh, process or this statement. Okay, so you can use this statement to show it's correct, but you first have to know what it is. Otherwise, you can't use the statement, so it's circular. It's crap, in other words. Okay, garbage, whatever you want to call it. Now, uh, let's go to the next slide. About a year and a half ago, I had a debate on a trashy site called Quora with an MIT graduate whose name is Anders Kesar. And this is what he wrote. He says, I do not have a reason I come up with everything, but it is valid for that reason to be intuition. Do you know what intuition means? Intuition is really based on feeling. It's not based on 
sound logic. Okay, so nothing is valid if it's based on intuition. Okay, and intuition is not a reason for anything. And then he says, as long as I'm able to prove it later on, which I am, that's a lie because he's never, he never was able to prove it. So, he, he, and then in the very next paragraph, he says, I get completely rigorous formulation, formalization of the derivative x cubed that does not ever involve setting h to zero. But look, how can you get the derivative 3x squared without setting h equals to zero here? You just can't. There's no way you can get it. So he says we observe that this appears to get arbitrary. Oh, really? We do observe that? There's only one way we know that, and that's by setting h equals to zero. So to prove it seems almost senseless, because if we set h to zero, we get 3x squared, and there's really nothing to prove. In essence, this whole uh, lingo here is an excuse uh, to say that they're not dividing by zero. But division by zero has already taken place to get to this particular expression here, because h <coughs> is a value <coughs> that cannot be divided by. Okay? In other words, it's neither zero and it's neither non-zero. It seems that mainstream academics can't make up their minds what it is. All right? So... <laughs> The next uh, comment becomes even more uh, intriguing. He says, why can't you understand the difference between assuming that f prime of x is equal to 3x squared as a fact? How can you assume that something is a fact? You just don't do that, upon which to build further proofs and hypothesizing that f dash of x might equal, might equal to 3x squared. And then notice that he says this in this statement, and he turns around and contradicts himself here in the next statement. I absolutely cannot and did not assume that f prime is equal to 3x squared. But he did assume it here. He said, assuming that that is a fact. So he not only assumed it, but he assumed it as a fact. And then the poor guy, confused as he says, I can hypothesize whatever I want, for any reason or no reason. <laughs> oh yes, precisely because I treat the hypothesis hypothesis is nothing more than an hypothesis until it is rigor rigorously proven. And so far, he's not proven anything rigorous rigorously, except to use a circular definition and show absolutely nothing. And so, so this is Anders K. Sorek's method. He assumes, proves, hypothesizes, and verifies using a definition. We can never assume statements are facts upon which to build proofs, because proofs are never built on assumptions. Hypothesis come before proofs, not after. Kesel contradicts himself many times. He has no idea how to form proofs, nor does he understand that intuition and assumption have no place in any field of rational thought. You can get the entire debate online. There is even a copy on the MIT site, so I'm not going to paste this in the details section. <laughs> Reason number four. For any horizontal line, the value of epsilon and delta are irrelevant, and consequently so is the definition given in 3. There is a weak attempt to use first-order logic as a proof that the definition works, but the implied truth table does not correspond in any way with the propositions in the definition. And finally, it gives rise to, the contradiction, to a contradiction in the meaning of the tangent line. Mainstream academics no longer know what it means to be a tangent line. They've simply become so confused, so out of touch, um, because of all the ill-formed concepts they're using. They just don't know what it means to be a tangent line any longer. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and I hope you'll join me again next time for another interesting uh, exposition of ignorance and stupidity and incompetence in the big stupid, also known as modern academia. Till next time, goodbye.